Hello everyone, I hope you're well. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about the five things that mark your photography progression, mainly in architecture photography, because that is what we shoot and talk about here on this channel. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is James Kerwin and this is me. I'm an architecture and interior photographer from the UK and I love shooting abandoned places, relics, ruins, hidden gems and ghost towns, as well as off the beaten path locations all around the world. I'm posting new videos every Sunday and until the end of March 22, every Wednesday as well. So why don't you join me for the ride by subscribing and you can also check out my website in the description below. Okay, so number one is definitely light. Look around me, look at the light. It's absolutely amazing, isn't it? So without this light, this scene wouldn't be half the shot that it actually is. In fact, my best selling prints over the years have always been where I've got some sort of dynamic light in the shot. I'm just going in and shooting something and just getting in a great shot can be done anywhere, anytime. But adding in the light and beautiful light can make it from a good shot to amazing and print worthy. And that's the difference. Let's delve into light a little bit more now. I mean light as in seeing the light, knowing what makes a good photo, knowing how your style is applied to lighting and how lighting affects your style and how you like to photograph your images, how you need to process the images, how you need to work with them. And understanding the light and the concept is something that comes a bit over time. Obviously trial and error with your camera, going out, playing with things, taking those 10,000 images roughly <laughs> to kind of make sure that you understand lighting and how it affects your work. And obviously, by this point, you probably should know roughly how you're gonna be shooting, what sort of places, is it commercial, is it more sort of like personal work like I do a lot. Um, it really depends on you and kind of what you're looking to get out of your work, but light is the number one most important thing and it goes without saying. Okay, so number two without a doubt is lens choice or focal length versus subject. What I mean by this is essentially like choosing the right focal length. Just because you've got 11 mil, 11 to 24 mil super wide angle lens, that wouldn't be the choice for these stairs here. You would get a lot, a lot of flaw in your composition. It probably would look a little bit, a little bit sort of unbalanced is probably the point. Zooming in a little bit, punching in, and actually filling your frame would be a better choice here when we're shooting a one point perspective of these stairs. And straight on is what I mean of these stairs. So punching in a little bit would be a better end result. Something even one step further would be something like this 24mm tilt shift lens. Uh, if you're going to shoot something like a pano or some sort of way of lifting the lens up, actually just shifting the lens and actually just pulling the overhead into your shot, that would probably be even better. But understanding the differences and the actual things that these are going to do and the differences to your end result, that's what this point is all about. When you walk into a scene, understanding which one is going to complement that scene best, which focal length, which lens, and then you're good to go. So for instance, recently I visited Lebanon and photographed for a book and, and many of the locations that I visited inside of the country really suited a 24 mil shot as you see here. These spaces kind of really only have one focal point. It tends to be these triple arcade windows in the center of the scene and shooting a 17 mil version of this would be a little bit pointless, a little bit wide, maybe too wide in some instances. Of course, there was occasions where the 17 mil worked with a panoramic and pushing it towards the ceiling, for instance, and drawing in the beauty above down to the viewer's eye. But realistically, 24 mil was the versions for most of these shots, and it is the better focal length to select overall for the project. And many of these locations suited that particular sort of compressed style over something wider and more stretched. I've got some other versions here where, of course, shooting wide wouldn't necessarily work. Most of these are shot either on 24 or 35 millimeters. If tilt shift photography is your thing, I've got some great videos that I pulled together here, linked above, uh, that mark all about kind of how you shoot tilt shift lenses, how you use them. Uh, number two is like, part two is all about like panoramics and part three about editing those images. And they're all linked here and in the description below. Oh, by the way, do you like my jacket? Look at the state of it. <laughs> it's freezing cold in Italy, um, but I've been having absolute attacks of bramble bushes. Bramble bushes attacking me all week, so luckily this coat is going in the bin soon. 
So the next thing that marks your progress, number three, is composition. Now I've got some bits on this channel I've done before, one point versus two point perspective, and they're marked up just up here. So go and check that video out if that's something that'll help you. The other thing as well is, when you walk into a scene, understanding whether you're gonna do a one point, a two point perspective, maybe even a three point, and pull yourself away from the sort of compositional norms, that's kind of what the point is, walking in and understanding what it is you want to do. Um, I used to just walk into scenes maybe eight years ago and not really understand the kind of ideas behind my photography, which angles work best, which ones kind of under, you know, work. And there's no harm in going away from that, but the thing is it's understanding which ones work, which ones don't, before you can then go away from it and make things a little bit arty, a little bit different, if that's what you're looking to do. So yeah, number three, let's delve in a little bit deeper with these examples having your composition in mind that you're looking for or playing with your composition or moving your camera around not on the tripod and finding a composition that suits you or suits the scene really, not necessarily yourself, really is the way to kind of look at it, kind of go around, find a subject, find the composition that you're looking for, work it, work it through, and then eventually use the live viewing camera if you have to and eventually then take your photos. Um, Composition is something that we really need to think about in architecture photography in particular, mainly because of high roofs, stretching them, ceilings, where's the detail? Where's the cool things in the subject? And by the way, just because we're shooting in architecture doesn't mean the foreground doesn't matter. So yeah, composition is the third most important thing. Okay, so the next one, number four, is post-processing understanding what you want to do with your final result before you actually do it. And actually, some of the prior points actually work best. Getting the count, getting the shot, getting the image right in camera, getting the best raw files you can before you start editing is probably the best thing, the best practice that you can do. That again gives your end result. You know, if you've got amazing light, amazing composition, great raw file, shot of the right technique settings, post-processing is going to be a lot easier. What I mean by post-processing though in this example is really understanding what it is you want to do with your end result before you do it and actually applying a style, your style, to those end results as well to get the images looking and feeling the kind of right way. Um, I recently brought together a book and to get those images looking the same was quite a challenge and that's the kind of thing that I mean. So slowing down, looking at your examples and actually pulling together your editing style, not just seeing something you've seen online and like replicating that kind of idea, but actually slowing down, looking at what you want to do. Great raw files, actually nine times out of ten that will give you a better end result. The thing is with post-processing we all process our images in a different way. We all look at different things, we look at the way we process our images and we get inspiration off of different styles of photography and that's pretty cool. We all like that. If we were all the same it would be pretty boring place, right? But the problem is with post-processing you need to develop this over time and I think once you get an understanding of how to post-process your images, how it works, and how it would work on a format like Instagram as opposed to your website and your portfolio, they're things we all really need to bear in mind. I've made mistakes in the past where I've overdeveloped an image as well, where I've kind of processed it too much or maybe made too much shallows, too much dodging and burning. What is dodging and burning? We need to kind of understand all of the, the, these dis different aspects and the different skills that make up the, you know, the techniques that you can put into your arsenal to photograph and, and, and understand the subject better and get a better end result especially for portfolio level work. It's mainly, this one's really for those full-time or looking to go full-time photographers out there. It's not necessarily important for everyone who's just like a, an amateur or somebody who just likes taking photos for fun. But for full-time pros or people looking to get into photography and earn some money out of it, marketing's incredibly important who you meet along the way, the relationships and the contacts you build up, and more importantly, how to get your work out there and how to get your work seen. Over the years, I've got better and better at marketing. It helped for me that I actually worked for seven years in an event and marketing company. So actually that helped me quite no end in terms of like marketing, my, my photography and what it is that I want to do with it. Over the last couple of years, obviously things have got a bit tougher with the pandemic and everything that's been going on. But nine times out of 10, if you understand marketing and understand the principles behind it and advertise your photography in the right way and get it reached by the right people, you know, for example, if you're looking to sell prints, there's no good trying to reach out to photographers. If you're trying to sell, for example, workshops, you're better off to reach to photographers. You want to be making sure photographers see you. 
So there's a big difference there. If we're trying to sell print, we want to be in maybe some sort of art magazine. If we're selling kind of like photography workshops or want people to come on our tours, potentially we want to be in photography magazines. And that's the difference, understanding the different types of people that are really looking at your work and what your end result is going to be, they'll give you. So for instance, in my personal work, um, I could publish the same photo on my website for a print for sale, or I could publish it on a stock photography website. If I put it on the stock photography website, yes, of course, I might make loads of money over time. Probably not likely, but I could make some money over time. The problem is with this is if you're trying to sell it as a print on your website as a portfolio piece, then the likelihood is you're not really going to end up kind of getting um, you know, decent revenue from prints for that particular piece of work. It's unlikely, actually, that anyone would really buy it as a print if they can go on the stock site, download it in full resolution, print it themselves at home. You're never even going to probably even know about it. So knowing which image needs to go to the right places and which ones are going to sell is, is very, very important. That's kind of a topic probably for another day. Um, when we talk about, like, marketing, it's a huge subject um, and one that I feel like is a particular strong point of mine considering I worked in that field for seven years. But at the same time, it's almost like we need to understand it as photographers that you can't always do stuff for free. And that applies to anything. Like if I was going to go and do some commercial work for an interior company, then it very much plays into my hands to do some stuff for a cheap price, get my client happy, build that relationship, and then go out and use that work to go and get myself more higher paid gigs. That's a great way of doing things. Doing it for free all the time or trying to build your portfolio for free is a very limited way of doing things because people only value your work at what you set it at. So you're always going to get clients at the price point. In fact, in some ways, you're better off to aim higher than you are on the lower end of the market. People expect, respect you that way and you can build longer standing relationships. The other thing as well we need to bear in mind is it's not just about that. It could be also tagging, making Instagram shops, making sure you're tagging things properly on social media, making sure that actually you're marking everything clean and spelling correctly and making sure that your photography looks as good as it can be before you promote it. If you're not happy, don't post it. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed this video. That's absolutely everything for today. Um, something a little bit different. I thought I'd use this beautiful location to my advantage in Italy while I was here. Um, if you want to support me in some way, there's books down below that have been released recently. You can click on those and you can purchase one of those as well. Leave a comment below if you've got anything you wish to add, any other things, any other tips you give in terms of like a progress for photographers, how they can mark their progress, then please do leave them in the comment section below and I'll ensure to come back to you. Of course, if you want to be notified next time I upload a video, please do hit the bell notification and subscribe and you'll be alerted. Until next time, bye-bye for now. See you soon.